Ladies and gentlemen, our next fireside talk is AI, the most powerful force of our age? Question mark. Moderating is Leah Haikel, Editor-in-Chief, MIT Technology Review Arabia. Please welcome Leah to the stage. Good morning, sabah al khair. It is my pleasure to welcome today His Excellency Omar Al-Alama, Minister of State for AI in the United Arab Emirates, a one-of-its-kind position in the world, literally. Your Excellency. Yeah, you should have a... We'd like to request a mic for His Excellency, please. Great. Your Excellency, it's always a pleasure to see you, to talk to you about AI and the future. And I'm going to start by asking you, you've now been Minister of State for AI for two years. And what do you see the most important development in AI that happened since then? And what do you see the most challenging advancement that happened since then in the AI field? Thank you, Leah. It's an absolute pleasure and honor being here. Um, and I hope that everyone took notes. La the last session was very important. We hope to see billion dollar companies come out of this crowd right here. And to be honest, I think there's a perfect transition to artificial intelligence. If you look at the current trillion dollar companies in valuation, most of them are artificial intelligence companies, and they are companies that are transforming our lives as we know it. In the past two years, we've worked very uh, tirelessly to understand what this technology holds for the UAE. How can we responsibly maneuver around this technology to ensure that each and every single one of you has a better life when we look at deploying AI? And how can we overcome the challenges while also leveraging on the opportunities? We've worked with many partners from around the world, with many other countries as well. So we've signed partnerships with seven countries from around the world to learn from them and to also share our learnings. We've deployed AI in certain sectors like healthcare. We've deployed AI in the UAE to diagnose tuberculosis, which is a very dangerous disease in a cosmopolitan country like the UAE, a country that has 200 nationalities from around the world that live and thrive in it. And we're looking right now at deploying AI aggressively in healthcare in a diagnosis uh, perspective to ensure that diagnosis in the UAE is the most cutting edge globally. We've also looked at AI from an angle that does not have any uh, controversies, looking at the benefits of AI in sectors like infrastructure development. We spend a lot on our infrastructure. We have billions of dollars in investments in infrastructure. So we have deployed AI as well to ensure that our infrastructure development aspect is cutting edge, while at the same time ensures safety and security for our people and reduces the resources required or necessary to ensure that we can deliver this infrastructure. Okay. And there's a global uh, concern that is rising on security, on data privacy, on uh, liability, on ethics and ethical behavior of AI. So do you think when government basically interferes to set rules, this would hinder the widespread of AI adaptation, applications, and advancement? Absolutely, and absolutely not. So it's okay. a double-edged question and a double-edged answer as well. Mm -hmm. If you look at every technology on Earth, government has intervened when something went wrong. That is how the technology was able to prosper and to continue uh, improving, while governments really didn't do much about it. With AI, some of the applications of the technology have very bad uh, repercussions on the lives of people. If you look at deep fakes today, if each and every single one of you sees any piece of content about themselves, doing something that you haven't done in a way that causes defamation or causes issues for you, you wouldn't accept it. So certain uses of artificial intelligence should be governed. Artificial intelligence, for example, for autonomous weapons that are able to kill people in a very effective manner are something that none of us want to see come to existence. So I don't think it's about governing the technology as a whole. The technology has many different use cases. It's many technologies under one umbrella. It's about understanding what the final outcome of the technology is and then governing that. There are concerns today that if you look at the big companies globally that collect data and live off data, their incentives is to collect as much of data as possible and then leverage it to sell you things or to affect you psychologically. 
there is a requirement for these companies to invest even more in protecting that data. Mm -hmm. If Google or Facebook or Microsoft or any one of these companies has so much private data about myself, Omar or Via or anyone else in the, of the crowd, it's important for them to invest as much as they do in collecting data or more so to ensure that this data is protected and that no one can use this data to you know, push me to do things I don't want to do, whether it's affecting political decisions in certain democratic countries, whether it's affecting norms that people do not want to do, or even at uh, extreme cases, pushing for things that create genocide. So there are studies that prove that the genocide that happened for the Rohingya in Myanmar was created because of the immense data that Facebook had, because someone used the algorithm to push people to be more aggressive. People weren't aggressive in the past, but in the mm -hmm. era of social media and of data, mm -hmm. they were able to do that. So government needs to intervene in these use cases. Excellent. So in the coming five years, let's not go so far, in the coming five years, which industry do you see AI affecting the most and advancing in the most, and in what ways? If we're looking at the positive um, impact, I would say healthcare is going to be impacted drastically by artificial intelligence. I do not think that there is any doctor on earth today that is better than an artificial intelligence system in diagnosing any disease. Because these systems are able to crunch so much data in seconds and learn from all the previous data without being tired, without you know, uh, being fatigued as well. I think that radiology and pathology in specific diagnosis is going to be done by machines in the next five years, and it's going to make our lives so much better. Anything that has or runs on a set of rules, any sector that has rules for it to actually operate, will be transformed by artificial intelligence. And I think if we look at the way that we currently live our lives, uh, 10 years ago, if I told you that you could not live without your smartphone, you would laugh because we did not have smartphones as a key component of our lives. Today, your business is on your smartphone, your communication and your loved ones are on your smartphone, your entertainment is on your smartphone. And that is because of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is not going to transform our lives, it's already doing that today. What I think is going to happen even more so is it's going to become a necessity. It's going to be the oxygen of our lives in the future in the next five to 10 years. Great, so on the example of doctors and diagnosis and AI. How do you, or how soon do you think we will see AI evolve without human intervention? And what does that mean for us? I mean, there is a big debate globally on this now with supporters and people against. You know, I, I always like the uh, science fiction hypothetical questions that are being asked. And I think that it's important for us to look at all the different angles of the technology. The technology can evolve today as it stands without the intervention of humans. So we just, you know, give it a goal and it'll keep learning as it goes along until it becomes better. And then we intervene to check if there's bias. We intervene to check if it's actually doing the task that was given to it. So this is something that exists today on a narrow spectrum. Whether we will achieve the singularity or whether we are going to achieve the Terminator scenario is something that is plausible. So there's a 1% chance that it will happen or a 100% chance that it will happen. But there are many big concerns that we need to face today. So I think the, the bigger concerns today is how social media can be used to weaponize individuals against governments or how mm -hmm. you know, artificial intelligence can be used to affect people's political decisions, or how artificial intelligence today is making us operate differently as a species with regards to our habits, with regards to our culture, with regards even uh, to our interaction. We can't talk to each other anymore. We're always on our phones. So you have a 10-hour conversation with someone on WhatsApp, but the moment they come in front of you, you can't even have a two-second conversation with them. So there are certain things that are much bigger for risk today because I feel like we are being affected and we aren't doing anything about it. That to me is a much bigger concern in the near term than the long term, let's say, artificial intelligence being able to progress without us. I'm going to leave you with one uh, food for thought thing that I would like to give you. I don't think that artificial intelligence in the near term is the biggest threat that will face humanity. Mm -hmm. Because if I ask any one of you right now to go and develop an AI software, it's going to cost you a lot of money, you need a lot of infrastructure, and you need talent to go and do that. There is, or there exist today, biotech kits that cost less than $1,000 that anyone here can order online. You can sit in the garage of your home or in the basement, 
and develop or manipulate a disease that can go and kill 100 million people overnight. This exists today. Mm -hmm. This can happen in the US, this can happen in China, it can happen anywhere. What's happening about that? That's a much bigger risk to us and our existence than artificial intelligence that can go and learn on its own. So we need to get our priorities straight. We need to really focus on what matters to individuals today and not be uh, steered away the, uh, out of the, you know, what matters by looking at the long-term scenarios when it comes to artificial intelligence. There is a concern, but I don't think it's as big of a concern today as we think. Okay, great. So because we're running out of time, I have one last question for you. When do you see your role as Minister of State for AI is done? Um, I, I get asked a different type of question, uh, which is, why do you have a ministerial position for artificial intelligence? And I think that it links perfectly with this. If you looked at ministerial cabinets in governments in the 1800s, there wasn't a single minister of energy because the main fuel source was wood and coal. Mm -hmm. When oil became the uh, main driver of development globally and electricity was discovered and was being used, ministers of energy were put in place. If you ask them how long do you think your role would last, none of them could have given you an answer and we still have ministers of energy today. With the advent of telecommunications, with the advent of the internet, ministers of ICT and telecommunications were created as ministerial portfolios. Because they are technologies that don't just affect a single facet of government, it affects all of government. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence is not going to impact just one small stream of government or the lives of people. It's going to affect society, it's going to affect economy, security, everything. You name it, it's going to be affected. So there needs to be someone that looks at this in the long term, that looks at the deployment, that looks at the use cases, that looks at the challenges and the opportunities. And I do not think that this is going to be a short-term project. Uh, I hope that I can deliver value as a minister. My job is to serve the people. My job is to make sure that our country is at the forefront. But I do believe that there are going to be many other people that take this baton. And if you look at leaders from around the world, whether it's President Putin or President Xi, or even the presidents of the Western world, all of them say that artificial intelligence is the most revolutionary technology. Why isn't anyone putting someone to actually take that technology and use it to benefit the lives of people, to improve quality of life, and to make sure that the future is a bright future rather than one that has challenges. Well, thank you so much. This has been insightful and reassuring that we're on the right track and nothing is threatening us in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you.